Well, delighted to have you here. Thank you for making the time to talk to me. My pleasure. I'm excited Sincerely. about it. Um, Miguel was like, you got to get Sadie on. I know. I like, what a good cool. big brother. A little brother. He's so big. I always call him my big brother. He's but a big he little is brother. my little brother. Right. He's not your blood brother, but you guys mm-hmm. grew up together. Yeah. Which we're going to talk about, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. a very cool and unusual upbringing. I think what's mm-hmm. interesting about that, and we'll dive into it a little bit more, is that both of you created these massively successful businesses that are really driven by the core values that you grew up with mm-hmm. and are all about belonging and community mm-hmm. and connection. You're doing it in different ways, but mm-hmm. in many, it, it's sort of like they're, they're an extension of what you learned as kids growing yeah. up in that community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't we start with, mm-hmm. um, I, want to, I want to start with talking about the conventional conversation around fitness versus mm-hmm. the conversation that you're having. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, conventional versus the conversation we're having. I, um, just to step back, I didn't use the word fitness. We've, my husband and I co-founded Bar3 mm-hmm, in 2008 right. is when we opened. I've been in the fitness industry my entire professional career. I fell in love with it in the 80s like meeting Jane Fonda in my living room right. with my mom. Uh, it, it just drew me in right away for various reasons. And when we opened Bar 3, we didn't use the word fitness because I had it anchored to negativity and being a chore and something that I didn't identify with. And it wasn't until about eight years ago or um, eight years in, that I took we took back that word fitness uh-huh. and we're redefining it. So what is that redefinition? And there, first of all, I want to point out there's nothing wrong with fitness as we all know it. It's just it. Um, my relationship to fitness was broken, right. and so I needed to redefine it. And and I I noticed that a lot of other people do as well. Well, why don't we start with how it got broken mm-hmm. in your own personal experience? Sure. My my story, I. I think I fell in love with fitness because um, to me, it was an answer to be badass and to show up successful, worthy, attractive, um, winning, you know? And um, I love the feeling um, of exercising in a group. So group exercise always drew me to the table. Uh, The fact that I liked it and it would make me better was Mm -hmm. really exciting. I'm a high performer, hardwired. Clearly. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And... So that that really drew me in and and ended up teaching um, by the time I was 19 years old. I, I went to City College in Santa Monica, mm-hmm. uh, Santa Monica City. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon. I went to City College, found my way to UCLA, started teaching there, um, fell in love with it there. And LA is so body conscious. I felt it was very body conscious and I was not happy in my body. Yeah. And... Um, and very disassociated with my body. And fitness was my answer to get back in my body and and shape up so that I would belong and have friends and be seen and be worthy. That's right. really what the inner driver was for me, if I'm to be completely honest. Uh, I ended up running the instructor training program there, went to grad school, did fitness there at William & Mary, and then landed a job with 24-Hour Fitness right out of grad school and worked there for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And was at the center of this a very successful fitness company. And well, let's just pause there for a mm-hmm. moment. Um, you you get your master's in education from William and Mary. Yes. I mean, first of all, like you moved to LA mm-hmm. kind of on a lark, right? Like mm-hmm. was the idea you were gonna go to Hollywood or what was the initial impetus in moving to Los Angeles, like right out of high school? The big one was to get to know my dad for the first time. Uh. He lived there and he didn't raise me. And I've never called him dad. He passed away uh, right. years ago, but uh, that was a big one. Uh, so I moved in with him and as an 18 year old got to know him. Right. Um, and I was also drawn in by uh, I thought I wanted to be an actor, and then I enrolled in my first acting class and did not <laughs> like the actual acting part. <laughs> right, okay. I think I just wanted to reinvent myself. Right. So, well, this is the land of that, right? Yeah. You, know, you yeah. came to the right place for mm-hmm. that. Um, but then you 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 sort of find your way to the fitness world at some mm-hmm. point, and you also um, fall in love with learning in a different way that was distinct from your high school experience, from what I understand. Yes. You did your research. I yes, always do. I love it. I know you do. 
Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So I, first of all, I went to alternative schools in my primary years and, um, art focused, lacked the basics Uh unless you were innately driven towards math and grammar and linear. A lot of pottery. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was drawn to the arts. And mm-hmm. so that the school allowed me to do whatever I wanted to do. Got to middle school, didn't have the basics. And on top of it, I had low self-esteem around my ability to achieve in the academic world, in this linear world. And then got to high school and survived just on like you know, social acumen and uh, having fun, uh, sitting in the back of the class, acting like I didn't care, even though I did. I just didn't want to try because I had such a fear of failing. Right. And, And how much of that was a reaction to the alternative, you know, kind of lifestyle that you were living at home in this community of women? And my, my mom, my mom and her best friends, uh, raised us collectively, basically. And they are all single moms and they raised us kids to collect collectively. And to their credit, which I think is a beautiful thing, is we as a family celebrated mediocrity. Like you did uh-huh. not need external measures of success to belong in our family. It That was just sort of nice, but that's not what matters. What What's going on inside? What was your dream last night? You know, how are you mm. feeling? Um, what's your gut instinct? You know, I was always validated for my inner world and the outer experience was not measured. Mm. That was our practice at home. Right. Then you go into the real world, you step into school, and it's all about external measures. That's why I think I was drawn to fitness because I excelled there. I um, exterior, my exterior was accepted, and and I was like, well, if that's my worth, then I'm going to make it even better. Mm-hmm. So I belong. I'm seen. I have a connection with other people. Right. But you didn't play. You didn't play sports in Not high school. Not a single sport right. ever. Cheerleader. <laughs> kind of, but yeah. I have to say, and I love if any of the gals on my cheerleading team are listening to this. I love you all so much, and I do believe you're inner athletes, but. In the 80s at South Eugene High School, it was not a sport to cheer. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. But there is something we kind of promise. beautifully poetic and hilarious about the fact that like Miguel becomes this, you know, amazing basketball player and you're a cheerleader. Oh, like, we're so different. Oh, I know because you know it's, what I mean? so, coming, it's so coming like out Americana. Of like this, right, I know. right. It's, <laughs> yeah. There is a reactionary aspect to that, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We're I mean, I used to joke that we were playing normal. Right. You know, we we would go to school and play normal and then go home to our alternative, <laughs> you know, who we really were. And your yeah. mom and, and your aunties are still all together, right? Yeah, it's greatest love story That's ever. That's amazing. It's the greatest love story ever. They still in Eugene? Yes, most of them. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're um, dear, dear. They are my auntie mothers. I mean, I don't really have... Um, a title for them because they're not really my aunts, they're not really right. my mothers, but um, you know, with every cell they are. I mean, I feel feel them just as much as my birth mother. Yeah, it's interesting that we reflect on that as being kind of off kilter when in reality it's much more natural than the way we live now. You know, and mm-hmm. I and I feel like you know we're experiencing this epidemic of loneliness yes. and and depression and all these you know anxiety related disorders. Yes. And they're rooted in our lack of connection yes. and our lost sense of community that, you know, that upbringing kind of perfectly, you know, encapsulated and prioritized. That's precise, precisely what I've been ruminating about lately, mm. is that it is so intuitive to sit shoulder to shoulder with women around a fire. Think about that. Humans, doesn't matter who you identify with. It is in us as human beings. In village, to be in village, to be around a circle, to be seen and heard, and to have a role that was important. Mm-hmm. And what was once very intuitive for all of us, it is still intuitive for all of us. It, and now it needs to be intentional. Yeah, you have to go on a retreat. Yes. Like you just did. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which was so, no pun intended, but full circle. Uh-huh. I was the oldest woman there. I was, I'm 47. They were mostly y- uh, younger women. And they were going through this investigation of dropping out in their own way, like my mom did in the 60s, um, and to get back in their bodies, to own their power, to um, 
be connected again and and not disassociated with their femininity. Right. And it was so special for me to see them sitting in circle just like my mom did in the 60s and and reinvent themselves and me too I was fully participating but from a different I think a different point of view because I grew up so differently than everyone. It's interesting how these things go in cycles. Like yeah. there was the summer of love and everything that that birthed and then that kind of went away and we're seeing an, a a new wave of that yes. happening now. Yes. And I think it's a reflection of kind of, you know, what we're missing. There's something innately human. Our mm-hmm. intuition is saying like, I need more of this mm-hmm. and I'm going to intentionally seek it out. Yeah. How many times have you gone to a dinner party, for example, um, longing for community and connection, breaking bread with people and leaving, feeling depleted, disconnected, um, even more lonely. And for me, it's, it's, the dinner parties exist, you know, the social things exist. Like I'm around people all the time, but leaning into intention of really connecting deeply, setting the phone down, asking a real question, listening intently, mm. all those things, we practice being distracted all the time. And we're really good at that. Yeah. And my big aha is that we need to practice active listening, connecting, um, sitting shoulder to shoulder, really seeing and hearing each other to get back to that that belonging we all have and that yeah. longing to be to be connected. Yeah. I think it's in it, it, it's sort of intuitive in the feminine to to yearn for that and mm-hmm. to reach out and take action on that. I think mm-hmm. it's more difficult for men, mm-hmm. although just as much needed. I think it's harder for guys to say I'm going to go on a retreat with a bunch of men and we're going to talk about our feelings. You yeah. Know? But I think that that is that's something that I mean, I love to do and have done, and I think it 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 it. Uh, I think embracing that feminine aspect of, of being male is something that yeah, we're missing and need. We more of. all have feminine energy, and we all have masculine energy. I have a, I have arguably more masculine energy than my husband. Like I show uh-huh. up all the time on stages. Like that's very masculine. I you know I'm very out there in the world that way. We all have both. And in my experience, in fact, this just happened. I presented at the How I Built This Summit, and I I did something out of my comfort zone, but I just knew it was going to work. I had about 100 people in the audience, and I did a session on Leadership Circle, uh-huh. which is how I've taken this idea of connection into a business environment and with a little vulnerability. And most of the audience were men. And... Um, because I couldn't hold circle with 100 people, I did a fishbowl circle. And I I had no idea if people were going to bite. But at the very end, I said, okay, so I, I'd like to have some volunteers to join me on stage. And we're going, everyone's going to listen, so we'll mm-hmm. all be part of circle. But six of you are going to share this question. And I gave them a juicy question. And the men's aren't, hands shot up. Oh, they wow. got up on the stage. They were, I, 50, I did 50-50, 50% those who identify as male and female. And... Uh, my in my and vulnerability was equal and beautiful and awesome and and authentic. It wasn't that everybody used their own language. Uh-huh. And in my experience, when you invite it, men show up all the time. Yeah, you got to give them inv- permission. Yeah. And did you open that by leading with your own vulnerable story yeah. to kind of set the stage yeah. and, and provide that permission? The whole yeah. part of my first part of the presentation was really holding the space and speaking. And I think this is where one of my unique genius is that because I played normal so well, I, I do get normal. Like I don't talk woo-woo. I, I'm very practical and- uh-huh. Except for the crystal you just put down on the table. I know, but it was it's <laughs> sneaky crystal. Yeah, I know. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, you didn't Keep know going. I had it until <laughs> no, I, I saw your other crystal friends yeah. and I wanted to hang out in the crystal circle over there. Um, yeah, I think that it isn't woo-woo and that I did lead with that. It's intuitive. We're human beings. We all long for it. And I asked questions. Have you been around the boardroom and been frustrated that your voice wasn't heard or self-aware that other people weren't being heard and seen? Mm. Are you lonely at work? Even if you own your own business, I know I was, I'm the, besides that year in Los Angeles when I first moved there, when my company was at the center of it, the most successful it's been, and it seemed like we were just booming on the outside and doing so well, I was the most lonely I've ever been Mm -hmm. in the center of my own company. And I think loneliness is an epidemic in the work environment. So as soon as I invited those questions, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then, and then you add the measures of success around it. Like when I started to, when I had the aha that I needed to bring this circle into the work environment, 
that's when things opened up. That's when innovation happened. That's right. when debate happened. That's when trust and workplace awesomeness came alive at my organization. But you had to get to a place where you were open enough and willing to you know, be on the receiving end of difficult news. Yes, yes. Um, really difficult. About two years ago, I was taken down to my knees. Uh, I, to start out, I, I did. We've always done a good job at Bar Three with in, training instructors and our franchisees in a really open kind of circle way. We actually sit in circle for every instructor training, and we have instructors come in from all over the nation and the world now. And the first thing we say in circle is. You are all as much of a teacher as I am if I'm leading the training. We, we're the anti-guru model. And mm-hmm. your wisdom and life experience is going to inform this training and move us forward without knowing one thing about teaching yet. And we go around and I, I ask everyone to share, what are you bringing to this experience? What wisdom are you bringing? And people will share, I was a division one athlete. I was injured. And that my whole identity around being physical was taken down and I anchored fitness to shame. And then I found bar three and I figured out how to be empowered in my body. And I want to give that back. You know, I'm a mom, you know, you hear all these stories and right from that beginning, they're like, I'm part of this. I matter. We did that so well with our product. Then behind the scenes, I was trying to follow the model. Like, okay, we have got a boardroom table now and we've got an executive team and we've got accountants and financial people and marketers. And I, I neglected that team. I didn't put that same intention into our headquarters. Right. And for a while there it worked because it was the the a first group of phenomenal women that helped us kind of run this, move this forward. Then I brought in other team members and as things happen, there's some a lot of toxicity in the company and a shakeup. And I was so identified with being a beloved leader and 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 that my worth is attached to being successful. Right. Um, external measures, right? Right. I, ironically, that even though my product is all about going inside and being empowered from within, like my whole identity unconsciously was about this thing, felt the uncertainty in the office. So we sent out a, I literally Googled healing survey, anonymous <laughs> healing survey. Uh-huh. <laughs> Help me, you know, in the 10 o'clock at night with tears streaming down my face, like, you know, shit was going down at bar three. And so we sent out an anonymous healing survey about how everyone was doing. And the results came back and there were stinging comments about me personally. Mm. As a leader, um, as a, it's still triggering, um, as a person. Uh, so, so I got- how the, Yeah, how did uh, that feel? It was earth shattering. Like it was my shake up moment. Now, two years later, greatest gift. Because I had a, a circle of support, and pe- at first I was like, "That's not fair! How could they? They suck!" And then I was like, "I'm going to sell this damn company." Can I swear? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm sure you could have gotten that kind of yeah. feedback from a bunch of friends too, who would tell you, "Oh, you're right, and they're wrong, and oh, you know, all of that." Right. So when you say you know circle what? of influence, no, what does that mean? These like, people didn't do that. Yeah, that's why they they are good. I have this group from. It's entrepreneur organization. It's a global organization. And I sit in a forum circle once a month with other founders. We're, right. we're all founders of the company. Like a YPO kind of yeah. thing? Yeah. And we're trained on, it's very much like I grew up, is just stalk communication and no advice giving and reflecting back, experience sharing. I texted them. I had the wherewithal to know to text them. I, was, I, it was a, I couldn't leave my house. I just, I was ready to just bail. They showed up with tater tots, my favorite food, um, <laughs> okay. and sat around the kitchen table with me, held my hand, and just listened and saw me. And one woman, Sue, does research for a living, and she said, "Well, let's look at it. Let's not let's not push it away. Let's really look at it." You know. So she helped me process it from a data perspective and t- help me get the emotion out. My other friend Pat said, "In my experience, when I got feedback like that." I, I owned it. And just being honest about owning that feedback is where I learned and grew. Yeah. That the combination of those two factors changed me. I I then took a minute and I stepped back and I looked at the data. I took out the things that were not productive. 
you know, the stinging comments of, uh-huh. that weren't real. Like um, people don't like your haircut yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, like that stuff. And um, and then really investigated the real things that were hard for me to see. And I realized I can't fire myself. We're, we're sole owners. We don't have board of directors. We don't have anyone. No one can fire me. It's my job to do the work and to show up for my team. So I sat on the hot seat and invited anyone else, but I was the only one that did yeah. it. I sat on the hot seat in front of the company and shared my whole company and shared the results. And I put together an action plan with measurable KPIs and how I as a leader was going to improve in the next four months. Once a month we got together, let's look at this again. Let's look at this again. The productive things. You know, and through that whole thing, I gave everybody permission to fail. Mm. We weren't striving for perfection anymore. Letting go of that perfectionist mentality. I mean, it's a it's a yeah. fascinating inflection point because you have this choice. Because you can't be fired, you're either gonna take the autocratic route and just clamp down and it's my way or the highway, or mm-hmm. you're gonna go the vulnerable route mm-hmm. and say, okay, like let's let's heal this, let's solve this, let me, you know, help me help myself so I can yes. help you. Yes. And I would imagine just the doing of that, like the reading of the the feedback in front of everybody would have shifted the tide and engendered like a, you know a, a, a level of trust and, and empathy going forward. I think it was triggering for some people. Yeah. There was some exits after that. Well, because you're like, <laughs> this is anonymous. And then now you're getting up and you're reading them all. But nobody no, knew nobody's where name, it came. of course. But it like, was, and we <laughs> made it so it was yeah. really safe. Like uh-huh. that that part. We did we did adjust, we didn't do actual feedback sentences, for example, word clouds and yeah. that kind of thing. So it wasn't and I think that that there were other leaders in the company. We all could have, all, all of us own the toxicity uh-huh. in the company. It, it's a shared responsibility. And all I can do is own my own shit. And the other thing I invited is please be compassionate. Um, I'm, I need your compassion. You know, I need to stumble too. Mm-hmm. And I think... I know that women who are in power now are overly celebrated in a way. In that, and believe me, I, I, the only reason I kept the title CEO is because I want to hold that. Um, but because there is so much emphasis on women coming into power that way, into corporate America and having big roles, we're higher on the pedestal and further to fall. Mm. We, yeah, and, and probably more under a microscope. And then right. you add fitness on top of it and the yeah. exterior pressures of fitness. Yeah. And well, if I could say two things, I mean, the, fir- the first thing is like, no matter what I take away from that is a lot, but one of the things is no matter how successful you are, you have to remain teachable, right? You have <laughs> to like set aside your ego and, and mm-hmm. remain open, which I imagine becomes more difficult. You become more calcified the more you kind of rise up that chain. And then the second thing, um, being, I just lost my th- my train of thought on that. What was it? Um, I forget. Keep well, going. Well, one thing it, for me is redefining what success means. Uh huh. Success is not about getting there. We know that. I think we all know that. It's about. Um, it's for me. Success is about being authentic to my values and showing up that way as a practice over and over and over again. And you can do that through work. You can do that through sport. You can do that through anything we do in life. We can embody our values as a practice. And if if I do that, that to me is success. And not becoming the CEO, not having hundreds of studios, not having... That's not success. It's how I'm practiced dealing with, how I'm resilient, how I love learning, how I have curiosity, how I build confidence, how I have strength. And if you and are you living in alignment with those core values oh. that you established this to begin with? I mean, I yeah. just remember my second thought, which has to do with that kind of um, lionization of the CEO and, and perhaps particularly the, the female CEO. And I think that's great. and. It's amazing that we are celebrating these, you know, empowered women in that way. But I think along with that, my observation is that there's a mythologizing that happens. Mm. And that puts pressure on that individual to like live up to a certain standard of 
behavior and operating practice. Like I, I think I read somewhere where you were asked, like, what's your morning routine? And you feel like you have to answer it in the way that they're expecting you to answer it. Mm-hmm. And and you're not allowed to answer it honestly. And that's mm-hmm. a divergence between expectation and authenticity. So yeah. as somebody who's so deeply intuitive and whose yeah. business is really birthed out of that intuition, yes. when you depart from that and create dissonance, there's uh. like a there's a fracture there, right? That creates these, ultimately leads to these inflection points that are either gonna break you or you're gonna return to that voice. And that isn't just in business, that's in everything. And I do think that we embody that. That's where injury comes, that's where illness comes. When we are disassociated with our values and not in alignment with them, our bodies react. Mm. And if you look at fitness as an analogy, I. I just over and over again, what we teach in the in our room at Bar Three is such an analogy of life. We there's 60 minutes of moving together as a group and aligning our body with intention, foundation, lining the body up, getting into posture in a in a way that with integrity. Um, but the real work is looking inside and figuring out what do I need right now, and then honoring that and moving in a way and taking shape in your body in a way that's right for what you need. Mm-hmm. When you're in a group. The expectation is that you're looking outside yourself and you're copying what everybody right. else is doing. On top of these conditions that full plank on the floor is harder, so it's better, and it's going to get me where I need to be. So I need to do full plank. But if you're doing full plank and you have like burning wrist pain, maybe plank is better at the ballet bar. And if you stand up at the ballet bar and everybody's at the fl- on the floor, that's literally and figuratively a practice of standing up for yourself and honoring what your body needs and honoring your values. Like I'm body wisdom, taking care of my body and not disassociating with it and trying to fight through it. And that's what I think the real work is, is practicing that over and over and over yeah. again. Um, I think I heard, I also read that you open the class by saying, you know, we're going to take you through this hour long experience and I'm going to say a lot of things or the instructor is going to say a lot of things. But the most important thing is that you listen to yourself, right? Like you kind of set that tone that that provides that like kernel of empowerment for the individual. Because we need to practice that. We all know that. Mm-hmm. We all know when we sit quietly, there's those moments you know your inner self, your inner knowing is is important. And that when you're aligned with your inner know- knowing, things sh- work out. Yeah. Um, because you start to make choices that are in alignment with that inner knowing. But we get, it, that just gets so quieted life writes on us and it pushes that voice down, 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 down. So it gets softer and softer and softer and softer and softer. And um, I was just talking to my mom about this on the drive over that she's like, yeah, I'm still working on that. Like we're still working on it. Like you just, it's such a practice to listen. And what I love is intersecting. My mom was intellectual. They they were so intellectual. They studied Carl Jung. And so their entry point for self-awareness was dream analysis. It was still it was sitting in a circle talking about dreams. Where I get that is in movement, mm. actually using my body mm-hmm. to understand that, like that my inner self can show up in different ways physically. Um, and I think that's so important back to the metaphor is that's when we show up at a presentation, when we show up for an interview, when we show up for the race, whatever it is, if we can show up with that authenticity, then it it's, you're teaching, you're, you're literally teaching everybody else to do the same thing. Yeah. And it's not a place that you arrive at. It's a, it is a practice, just like mm-hmm. fitness is a practice. And mm-hmm. we were talking in the kitchen beforehand and you were tasting Julie's cheeses. She was sharing a little bit about her business and you, you were saying, yeah, and it, it's here, but this is a practice. Like this is the beginning, but this is a practice that has no destination. Yeah, the cheese is on the table. She did it. It's amazing, by the way. But- it's arrived. She just launched it, but it's not done. Right. Like it's just going to keep going <laughs> yeah, and going. Yeah. Business is a practice. Yeah. Um, life is a practice. I also like interchanging the word practice with exercise because. You know Explain that. Like we exercise our right to do things. Um, we exercise um, justice. We exercise our ability to nurture, to mother. We exercise all kinds of things, including our bodies. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, Again, that intersection I think is important to remember. When you're exercising, you're exercising something else. And you're not just exercising your muscles, joint mobility, posture, connection, endurance. You're not just exercising that. You're exercising so much more. 
Yeah. Um, and that is when we do all three of those things. I think of it as physical exercise connectedness, mental exercise connectedness, and the third that's really important is social connectedness. Exercising social connectedness. Hence the three in bar three. There's so many good threes. Yeah. <laughs> three's so good, many right? Good threes. Yeah. yeah. My favorite number. All right. Mm-hmm. So so you move to Los Angeles, mm-hmm. you fall in love with not only learning, but group exercise. You end up mm-hmm. going to UCLA, you graduate mm-hmm. from UCLA, mm-hmm. you go to William and Mary, mm-hmm. you get a master's degree. Mm-hmm. And then you get this job at 24 hour fitness, which is in the dream city that you wanted to move to, San Francisco. Yes. So walk me through the experience of kind of, you know, joining that organization and 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 what you learned and how that kind of created the foundation for what you later created. Yeah, and just to close the loop on the academic story, I went to City College right out of high school. I mm. didn't even take the SATs. I was not the most likely to yeah. succeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you went to, like did you go to Santa Monica College? Santa yeah. Monica City. Can you get can you get into that without an SAT or did you have to take that at some point? Oh, it was point? so easy and so inexpensive. <laughs> and it was great. Yeah. I, I I was great in that it was hard because there wasn't social connectedness there for me because right. there wasn't it's dorms, very right? Dispersed. Yeah. yeah. So that was I was really lonely. But I did um I did have some beautiful teachers there uh-huh. who um sparked a love of learning for me. Yeah. And that really reminded me that ah, I have this curiosity and curiosity matters and then the grades come. Right. Then I got into UCLA. So to close that loop, right. that, that's an important story because I think kids these days are, it's so, my kid, we both have teens. My, ki- my kids are so pressured to get that A plus, A plus, 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 and do all mm. these things to get into the college and to make it. And it's there's, so cr- many, yeah. there's so many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many ways. That's a whole other podcast we could do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so San Francisco, I landed a job with 24 Hour Fitness uh, and thought I'd be there maybe for two years. It was an exciting job right out of grad school. I ran all the group exercise programming for, I think, around 20 gyms. It's an incredible first job. Yeah. It really is, kind of, other than like teaching fitness classes, I, it was true. really your first job, right? Yeah, really, really remarkable. I was 25 years old. Uh-huh. And the and founder- you get, It's not like you didn't get your master's in business, like you were no. in education, like how did you even get this job? Well, I did do fitness as my, I, I ran the fitness instructor training program at UCLA and I did the same thing uh-huh. at William & Mary. So I thought I was gonna run college rec program fitness. I, so I think that really helped. And I really yeah. love teaching. Mm. I was a, I, you know, I still, I still shine. I love teaching class. You still teach mm-hmm. your, your classes at your organization. Yeah. Too, oh, right? I love yeah. teaching. Yeah, love being a student. Love teaching. Uh, so landed that job, and it was quite the ride. I, uh, I ended up working for the founder and CEO. He's since left, Mark Masteroff, for many of those years, and he such an entrepreneurial spirit and it was really exciting working with him. So I, I really learned the business. Yeah, like how many gyms did they have when you started and then how many when I you I believe left? around 20. And then when I left, I know it was 430 globally. Wow. Yeah. And you were involved in that expansion, mm-hmm. right? Traveling to all these crazy places. All over that, the world. Right. And I also helped Mark with some of his other portfolio, not associated with 24 Hour Fitness. So mm. I was... I, I met. I mean, I just met so many interesting people all over the world exploring fitness and fitness as a business. Right. And and whoa, was it ever successful and lucrative and an exciting, big, booming industry? Right. Um, basically, you're going to business school to learn everything yeah. you need to know to yeah. ultimately launch Bar Three. Mm-hmm. Um, but this gets back to inflection points. Yes. You know, this is another big inflection point because you could have, you know, stayed there longer and continued to thrive in that environment, but something was leading you in a different direction. A, I wasn't thriving um, in that environment. Thriving financially. I was thriving yeah. financially. Yeah, Chris and I finally made enough money uh-huh. to buy the house and we had two kids. And, and Chris, you met and then recruited him into- Mark did. I mean, he okay. has a way of doing that. We had one lunch and suddenly uh-huh. my husband are, was working with me. But Right. Um, so I'm sure you get a lot of questions about what it's like to work with your husband, but you've never known different. It's, it's been our yeah. dance the whole way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been really, really worked well for us. Uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, all the things. Like, 
on the exterior, it was awesome. I And I had this really interesting opportunity to potentially go run yoga studios, which I love yoga, um, and do all these interesting things. And uh, we, I just wasn't happy in my own body during that era. And I was not identifying with fitness, the product that we were selling. And I had a lot of shame around it. Explain that. I'm sitting in meetings with all these people learning about these crazy numbers and the crazy growth of our company. I'm also learning from all these um, amazing consulting firms and the statistics and data that our health is on the decline. So as the industry is booming, our health is declining significantly. And so that's confusing. Right. I'm, I'm always like, huh. Obesity, Why aren't we diabetes getting better? rates are Obesity, going through when, the roof. When fitness as a product and service was invented in my mind, 1980. Obesity has doubled since mm-hmm. 1980. And yet the health club industry has uh, upper grown right even more corner, than that. Yeah. Upper right corner, year over so year, it's a thirty billion dollar industry to what this day. What is not working here? Fitness is working. Fitness, when you study it in a lab, you've studied it in your body. I have too. It works. Fitness is not broken. Fitness is good. What I have discovered is that our relationship to fitness is broken, and there is so much shame in that relationship. How predominantly to this day fitness is sold is that you start in, in the before picture and then you do the, bef- the products and services in a certain order and you become the after picture. That's how it's sold. There is, let's look at that for a second, the before and after. The, if you think about an after that's in the future, it's imagined, it's not real. There's nothing real about the after picture. And literally when you see a before and after picture, which still is prolific and that's what sells, um, it's someone else and how how they've achieved a physical measure of success. Sometimes there's a diary behind it that's like how I feel as well, but it's often a physical manifestation. So we can't ever get to that person. And by the way, that person's not that person anymore either. (laughs) There is no presence in the before and after picture. There is no presence in that. And there's a a shame in that. When I became part of the fitness industry and started Bar 3 with this awareness, our central core value is committed to real. And I fell into that trap. I ended up signing a book deal that I signed my rights away with imagery. They Photoshopped me almost beyond recognition. And they sold that picture, which is a ridiculous picture of myself. Ridiculous. They took away my veins on my hands, my wrinkles on my hands. That was the most for me, the most disturbing part. Because Mm. when I look at my hands, I see my grandmother like double jointed smoking her Benson and Hedges. Like, (laughs) just like, I feel like my grandma when I see my hands. Uh. I see my mother in my hands. They they took away my laugh lines. They gave me breasts. They gave me green eyes instead of blue. They turned my hair more golden. And they did this ad that was like, what if I told you you could get a lifted butt and thin thighs and all these things without barely moving a muscle? I mean, it was the most ridiculous this thing. was in the phase of, of Me bar, three growing, growth, bar three growth and and you kind of the anti guru suddenly finding yourself in the position of becoming the new guru because there was there were people invested in in blowing uh, you up and and making you a, a and, thing and that after look you know because it literally yeah. was a before and after they because they photoshopped me it's like the after right imagine not real I think we all know that now it, we've come a long way like the photoshopping we yeah. know that it's more disturbing now because social media it's the girl next door it's not the guru anymore with a hundred takes and maybe some filters. Right. So now it's even more confusing because it's quote unquote real, but not really. And the message is confusing. Um, but in that moment, I realized, well, you can't see what's going on on the inside. On the inside, I had chronic low back pain. I was depressed. I wasn't present with my young children. And I was, I was witness to myself being manipulated to look younger, to sell mm-hmm. and whatever, to look mm-hmm. something else other than I, I am. So fitness has been sold on... You are not whole yet. If you do these things, you'll be better. And And every year there's a new idea and a new fad and a new product and a new supplement. And on top of it, there's this extreme nature of fitness. The more extreme you go, the better results you'll get. So I always think of like there's comfort zone where you're in the center and your comfort. 
Then there's brave space where you go just outside of that comfort. And that's where in the body, like you're lifting mus- you're lifting weights, let's say, and your body goes to fatigue and failure, and then it rebuilds. That's brave space. You're rebuilding your muscle. Same with our mental capacity, just going just enough so that you're rebuilding, building resilience, building strength. And we do need that sand in the oyster to make the pearl. We need that rub in our bodies physically. But the industry goes so extreme that we go into panic zone. So many people enter exercise and they go heart too hard. They get injured. They anchor it to pain, to shame, to not looking the part. And then we get promised in one sweat sesh, you're going to be skinny and beautiful and perfect and awesome. Right. So there's just so many ridiculous, when we all talk about this, we're always like, that's so ridiculous. I know better. I know better. But the world says that all the time. Right. Intellectually, we know better, but emotionally we don't. Right. So And we've been, we, it, it, they we it plays into that thing of I want to belong. If I look that way, I'll be attractive. Yeah, I'll be successful. I'll be seen as successful. I'll happy. be worthy. I'll be happy. I'll belong. And what if this is the question we all ask ourselves all the time? What if we exercised to practice being honest in our bodies? Forget about even like feeling good in our bodies. Just honest, and that everything I do in that moment is about honoring who I am in my physical self and what I need in that moment. And the more we do that, you build that muscle. And that muscle carries you through so many things in life. Yeah, but I want the before and after picture. You know what I mean? Like the, yeah. that's a harder sell. It's a, oh, it's an my ephemeral, gosh. it's a it's a it's a much more de- I mean, you know, when you think is. when you think about the word fitness in and of itself is is strange because part of it is it's aspirational, but it's also this pejorative. You think of fitness and you think about a treadmill and you know underneath a fluorescent light. Yeah, and anchored and, in and that. And you think about a bunch mm-hmm. of people walking around that look better than you and yeah. you're feeling less than. Um, the whole that whole industry is built upon preying on people's insecurities to get you to join and then not actually attend so they yes. can oversubscribe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Spot on. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that's broken and mm-hmm. not healthy. Obviously. And it works. It yeah, makes it, money. Of course, of course. So it's legacy based. And I think that's why my my way is working too. Right. But and we're working our way up to that. Like yeah, how you've, you've and kind not of only this. me, so there's a movement now of changing that story. Mm-hmm. And that is what drives me. Yeah. That's why we're growing. We have plenty and enough. We have a house, we have kids, they're in good schools. I, I can travel, I have enough. I But the drive in me is to extend this movement. Right. Um, because I think the more of us that start exercising this way, the greater our opportunity is to change those external forces, to change those messages. It's not okay or normal that most women have body image issues. That's not okay. Like we we just pass that off now. Oh, that's a phase. All women go through that. Mm. That's not okay. Yeah, it's it's outrageous actually. It's not okay. Yeah. And we have the power, business has the power to change that. We can rewrite this story. And we are rewriting it at Bar 3 and so many other beautiful organizations are as well. And show, I love showing the business community that we're profitable and we're growing mm-hmm. and we are, people are choosing us because we have a different story. And that they are getting what they need out of it and coming back and, um, then starting their own concepts, right? Yeah. So I do, that's what drives me at this point. It is changing. You probably saw the the New York Times article about Mary Kane last week, who mm-hmm. was the, she was this, she was arguably like the next biggest oh, thing in track Nike, and field. Yes, yeah, the yes, Nike yes, athlete. Uh-huh. And they made this amazing uh, mm-hmm. like mini doc and, and mm-hmm. article about this. Lindsey Krauss wrote it for the New York Times and it really, it went crazy viral and mm-hmm. it created a conversation around these issues. Yeah. So you see it at the elitist level of sport. I mean, we're, we're talking more about, you know, the average person, the average woman, the barriers to entry into Which the is fitness most of community. Us. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> yeah. but but you need those, whether it's Amelia Boone who's been on the yes. show talking about her, her eating disorders. So yeah. Good. Or Mary Kane and, mm-hmm. and 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 Lindsay Krauss writing about these things yes. at the New York Times yeah. that are creating these conversations that I think are gonna tip culture and 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 reframe this conversation and get us into a healthier place with all of this. So powerful. Yeah. It's so healing for all of us. Um, 
And I, I think that one thing we do all share is we want to perform well yeah. in life and in sport and in our bodies. We all want that. And we want to be able to sustain it. Yeah. Yeah. Know? Just like business. Right. So if we grow a sustainable business, we'll be around for a long time. Mm. If I did hockey stick growth and sold per taps, we wouldn't have done so well in right. the long run. So it's kind of the same idea. So you're at 24 Hour Fitness for a little over a decade. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment where like, I can't do this anymore? Like, how did you come to the realization that you needed to blaze a new path? The first moment was when I became pregnant and I, I got back inside my body and to my roots, how I was raised and realized that, you know, you can't think a baby to grow. My body just did it. And that my body has so much power and wisdom on its own. And I started to practice yoga at home and started to move in a way that was super freeing and, and um, so enriching and rewarding. And then I'd go into a, even a yoga studio and I, I didn't have that same freedom. Mm. So that was, that, was, that was my moment where I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not broken. Maybe the fitness industry is broken. <laughs> like right. maybe... Every more people have this shame. It's not just because I'm in the center of fitness and I'm the face of fitness that I have the shame. Every, we all kind of have this, right? So that was that was like baby step number one for me, and that's what drove me into yoga and really loving my my kind of my heart is the philosophy of yoga. And then my husband and I made it. We had the house. By then we had two kids, and my husband was really the catalyst. Uh, he came to me one day with a spreadsheet explaining how we could sell our house in the Bay Area Hills. And with that, that and we put all our money, we were house poor into that house. Mm. If, for anyone who lives in the Bay Area knows, like it's, it's yeah. like a major <laughs> feat yeah. to buy a house. Yeah. Um, and so that's all we did. We worked to buy the house. We got the house. And then he's like, let's sell the house. Uh, and he, his- and This was like 10 years ago? How long this ago was, was this? was now 12 years ago. Uh-huh. Let's sell the house. And with that- chunk of change. Let's move to Bend, Oregon and drop out and not work for a full year and not travel or any, just be home mm -hmm. and simple with our children and experience our connection and our lives together. And it still like chokes me up because in that moment, I, I realized so clearly that that's how I was raised. Yeah. That's how I came so into you the can world. Go be like your mom. Yeah, my for mom a while. dropped out on purpose for that same reason to reimagine being a mother and being a woman and being intuitive and more primitive in a way. And I those were my formative years. And I grew up with this like hippie poor situation my whole life. Um, I was like, okay, I've done the hippie thing. I want to be a rich hippie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's figure this out a little we could different. Be super cool and boho <laughs> yes. on like, you know, mid six figures. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the the driver in me uh -huh. was he's are you familiar with the Enneagram? He's a nine on the Enneagram. He's uh -huh. a peacemaker. He yeah, flows. I I'm an achiever. That. I'm a three. So we're a good combo. So well, so he was he experiencing the same dissonance yeah, oh, in the job? Right. Hells yeah. He was worse than me. Because at that point, Mark had a crafted this incredible job for me. I was doing special projects for him at home. Mm. So I was able to be with the kids and do this cool branding work for fitness concepts. And Chris was out in the world, like trying to make it happen. And his spirit was just declining. He was uh -huh. really unhappy. And we were like, is this it? Do we have to just keep playing this game? All this fitness like, is making you unfit. Unfit. It was, yeah. And lonely. And that is also when we realize loneliness is a key ingredient to fit. To be fit, in fact, Cigna Healthcare CEO just came out with this statement that's so powerful that in all the research now, and arguably Cigna has incredible data on our, our state of well-being and health, um, that to, in order to thrive, loneliness is the key component. Yeah. Mental connectedness, physical connectedness, social connectedness. And we were basically missing kind of all three in a way, but the social connectedness was huge for us. Um, so we took that chunk of change and we started, we decided to start a business. Right. And that was bar three. We moved to Portland instead right. of Bend. Why not Bend? Bend's great. Yeah, Bend is great for Chris. I need a city. Yeah. I, I need um, a little more of that. And I say that and now we're looking at moving outside of Hood River someday because I'm ready for the country. <laughs> okay. I just need to get, I needed to get uh -huh. that out of me first. Right. So, <laughs> so not too hi hippie, but not too hippie. 
st- urban yeah. an ur- urban boho experience yeah. without having to work. Like I'm a, I'm an inner yeah. I'm an inner hippie. Yeah. But the the I, idea yeah. was to start this. The idea was not just a cruise, but you were going to start this business, right? So when did you have? When did you first have the idea for Bar Three? How long had you been? kind of harboring that. We'd, we were thinking about running yoga studios. So we were, all in the, we were already in the studio mindset. And I was teaching at the Daily Method, which is a lovely little studio, and loving the bar um, and wanting to make something my own that, mm-hmm. that really solved some other problems for me in my body and in the mindset of it. Not being att- I didn't want to be attached to a heritage. Yeah. No, no heritage. We don't have a method. We're not a methodology. Yeah. The, we're attached to a practice of recognizing imbalances and working towards a more balanced state. We're attached to the idea of be, being empowered from within and love of learning. So our concept is always changing. I think it's beautiful to have a heritage in ballet or a heritage in Lottie Burke method or a heritage of Pilates. Like I think those methods are beautiful and I wanted to try something different that was more evolutionary uh-huh. and we could just learn from bodies and grow and change and and... That doesn't make sense. When you put that on paper, that is not a good business model. And we didn't care because we weren't going to make work for a year anyways. So we let go of all formulas. Um, I was talking to your wife about that. It's like when you lead with business, you let go of the model, the business model, right. and you lead from what you think is right. And then the model catches up. Right. And that's what happened with that's us. A, yeah. That's exactly what, what how Julie kind of arrived at her thing. Yeah. But I did read that you read a book when you were at UCLA, like when you were like 21 or 22. Do you know what I'm talking about? Which one? Creative visualization. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is really keeps manifesting uh-huh. in so many ways. I sat on my porch step in LA with the sun and I did this visualization, just free flowing visualization of myself. And at the center of it was the word alone but in in an empowering, energetic way. And I was sitting in lotus pose with like monitors behind me. There was something digital. This was before, this is like 1996, Mm -hmm. before even any of this was really a real thing. And it was was this visualization of movement and connectedness being alone with, and I think I had like pictures of other women around me and but this idea of practicing this idea of standing up alone, like being yeah. in solitude that was and the connected seed. and the, that was the seed. And it, it keeps being, it's to this day, my practice. Right. It's amazing. It really manifested. Yeah. 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 So then like, I don't know, 15 years later or whatever. Yeah. More than that. Yeah. That more, more than that. I know. Gosh. 20, 20, almost 20, yeah, 20, 20, yeah, 20, 20 plus years. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so you moved to Portland mm-hmm. and you set about making this dream a reality. Mm-hmm. So what did that look like? Like you, you, uh, um, you start teaching for free first, right? Mm-hmm. Like while you're kind of workshopping the concept mm-hmm. and then ultimately open up a, a studio, like a, a former ballet space or what did it, what no, did, we did built it, go it out. In oh, fact, my brother helped design it. It was a family effort and it was, it was play. It was fun. We uh-huh. were in flow state because we gave our, again, we gave ourselves permission. We rented a little house. We went down to one car. Um, ta- the, our, my two little kids were with me all the time and, I rented a little space in Wild Oats, which is now Whole Foods. Upstairs, there was this. I walked into this room. Mm. It's you know when thing, you just things just start clicking. It was set up for my class. A woman there, um, Judy Moser, was teaching a program called Kalinetics, which was really big in the '80s. Which is similar. It's isometric work um, with a ballet bar. So it was yeah. all set up perfectly for me. And I think it was twenty dollars an hour to rent or something wonderful. And I created brochures, put them around town, invited some women in and started teaching. And I didn't overly investigate like my method. I just started teaching From intuitively. Intuition. Yeah, mm-hmm. intuitively. And I taught for like close to 20 years right. prior. So I had a lot of knowledge, but I I rested that knowledge too and really started to move in ways that felt right and sequencing the body towards balance. and. But fundamentally yeah. in the bar tradition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, that was my framing right. for sure. And, and like bars become this huge thing, but yeah. um, you weren't the first. There were already 
organizations that were doing this and competitors and things like that, right? Like, so it wasn't mm -hmm. like you were entering into this, trying to introduce people to a brand new idea. It was kind of in the ether, not like it is now, but. Well, a great timing too. Yeah. And that was a business, educated business decision. I knew Bar was going to take off. Why did you know that? Because it was sophisticated. It was a new take on fitness. It was not high impact. It was about being strong. It was women centric. Um, it was small, community based. It was to music. Mm -hmm. There are so many things I loved about it. We should probably define what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So bar, I'll talk uh -huh. about bar three, but and there are some things. Do you want me to talk about bar or bar three? Maybe bar first, okay. and then the, how bar three is different and the same. Sure. Bar originated. Um, by a woman named Lottie Burke who injured herself as a dancer. And she therapeutically rehabbed herself at a ballet bar and created the Lottie Burke method. And from what I understand, I'm not real close to this heritage. What I understand is some key, some of her key instructors moved to New York. They started studios. And this proliferation of this methodology started. And back then, all the different bar studios I attended, all founded by women, just Shout out there and all amazing. I, I have mad respect for every single one of them. Um, when I took classes back then, they were all very similar. It reminds me of Bikram, how other hot yogas will be the same 26 poses. Yeah. Similar. There were some nuances and definitely character changes and culture differences, but there was a system around it. You start with marches, you do these things. You da, 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 da. Yeah. So that took, that took off. Um, in the 90s, and then it came came around in the early 2000s. And then, you know, it's been, it was the fastest growing niche for mm. like five years mm. in all of fitness. And so that, I, I really, I really liked it. And honestly, I've been in the industry so long, it reminded me of a contemporary jazzercise. Right. Something about it, like uh -huh. the way that teachers taught, it was very kind of robotic, but in a good way, like a comforting way. And you knew what was happening and it was cool and it was fun and it was efficient and you worked like head to toe without sweating too much. And there were just all these cool things about it that I did like. Right, so you take that idea and then how do you extrapolate on that to create your own unique take? I had chronic low back issues and did not give myself, nor did I feel like the environment was conducive to modify. It, it Like ballet, it was very much about being symmetrical and following the method, the, the alignment right. method. Similar okay. to Yingar Yoga is very focused mm -hmm. on precise This precision. is divined by God. Yeah. And we will not divert yes. from the dogma. Right. right, it's so attached. And I always had this like rebellious nature where I wanted to do something crazy with my body and it made me giggle because I'm like, in fact, I did it once in New York City at a studio. I cracked up in the middle because I was dying. We were doing squats uh -huh. and I was dying. And I was in probably the best shape of my life. And there was a woman, I kid you not, that was like nine months pregnant, killing it right next to me doing, I, I couldn't do it all. And she was doing it. And it just, it just made, I burst out laughing more out of joy. And I said, you've got to be kidding. I said it out loud. Uh -huh. And the instructor stopped class and she said, I'm so sorry. She just really distracted me. <laughs> oh my God. How dare you? I was, but it was so, uh -huh. I was like, gosh, we need a release and laugh about these things and like give, have permission to laugh and like stop. Yeah, and holding just, on so tightly oh, God, to we it is on, part of the problem. We we're whole, we just achieve, 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 get there, get there, get mm -hmm. there. Um, the whole mantra was tuck, 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 we're supposed to tuck our pelvis and like these things. And I had really chronic low back pain and shame around it. And I, but I wanted to do it and I kept pushing myself into it and getting worse and worse and worse. And went back to that memory of being pregnant and started modifying. I started doing that at home. And plus, I was going through yoga training. My mind was getting blown. Mm. I trained with Annie Carpenter, who's freaking amazing. Um, and everything she was telling me was resonating. But the actual movement of yoga hurt my body. Um, it was, I'm hypermobile. I need more stability. There wasn't room for modifications, even though they said there was in flow, there's not really. And so that that's part of it is I wanted to create a practice where the reason we're exercising is to acknowledge, oh, I'm doing it like everybody else. I should be doing it like myself instead of right. trying to copying skips understanding. That's one of my favorite right. quotes. I read that in a book, Rework, copying skips understanding. And movement is an exercise of exercising body wisdom. 
of learning about your body. That's why I love it. Now I have my attachment to that versus it being a chore, shame, I'm not good enough, my injury is something I should push away instead of work with. And um, that's what Chris and I got excited about. Is mm-hmm. How can we do that? Is mm-hmm. that possible in a group environment? So you take all this experience that you've accumulated over the years uh, teaching to basically assemble a new sort of loosely held protocol. Assembling. Yeah, assemble. It's constantly it's evolving. Chief. It's right? still yeah, going. It's always going on. <laughs> and, and we really are always all, changing. All this experience that you, yeah. that you have, like growing this massive gym you know, yeah. organization, mm-hmm. and you're kind of perfectly positioned to mm-hmm. like make this a thing, right? So mm-hmm. when did you know that this was gonna work? The minute I taught, well, I had a feeling during the pop-up classes because it was just such a cool group of women that were coming and they were enjoying it. Uh Uh, But once we designed our studio, which was around community and bright, being bright and light, and aesthetics are really important to me and Chris both. We've learned that over and over again. So creating an environment, we put a childcare gate in the lobby because we had little kids. And so having that childcare component was important to us. And the sense of community and connection and relationship first exercise second. Uh Um, When I wrote an email out to the various people who had tried the class, I had got my certificate of occupancy that day. I said, I'm going to teach a class tonight if anyone wants to come. I had no idea if people would come. I think like 12 people showed up, they paid, and they they took the class with me. Right. And I it's I will never forget that moment, that first song, that first warm up. I just in my body knew this is so this is so gonna work. This What was it about that that told you that? It was like validation of I'm doing this my own way and they see themselves in it and they love it. They they're a part of it with me. Like those women, I still remember them, all of them. I yeah. remember the first woman who bought her membership. I remember all those women. They felt as much a part of it as as I did. I didn't feel alone in it. I felt very supported. Mm-hmm. And um, also the business side of it, I knew. It was 2008 too. It was August 2008 when the recession was at its right. worst. And But we all needed it so badly. Yeah, that's, that's the moment in time where the extraneous stuff like classes go out the window. Right. Yeah. In the gym concept for right, sure, because right. it's not a revenue driver. Right. Yeah. I was always pushed, like 24 hour fitness was exciting, but group exercise was dismissed. It wasn't interesting because yeah. it didn't show up in the bottom line. Yeah. It mm-hmm. seems like they've never been able to make that work at the big chains because it's fundamentally personality driven. Mm-hmm. I feel like, I mean, I don't know, you're the one who who mm-hmm. overlorded over all of that. Mm-hmm. But whether it's Equinox or these other huge organizations, they all have group classes, mm-hmm. but they don't create that that like excitement that the the boutique, you know, studios that are specific to one thing are able to generate. Yeah, in my experience, I felt a lot of in- enthusiasm and excitement in those classes in the big boxes. Yeah, I have felt that. I didn't feel Um, intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. And that is meaning like connection and, and like, I didn't ever feel like this is, I'm a part of it. Our thing. Yeah. We're doing this together. Yeah. I didn't feel ownership. Yeah. 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 And I, I, that's echoed right over and over again with other people. So, so, you know, this is going to work and there's a renewed or kind of redoubled commitment to build this thing in alignment with core values, right? Mm -hmm. That you've worked very Mm -hmm. hard to adhere to over all these years. Like what are those core values and how have you, you know, tried to keep the guardrails up to protect that over Mm -hmm. time? And while you're experiencing all this growth and all the kind of stuff that comes with that. Well, it's definitely a practice because the business world is so intoxicating And a lot of our values are inner motivated and the external measures and the external way of doing things are often in conflict. So our core values, I mentioned committed to real. And when that book came out with me being Photoshopped basically Mm -hmm. beyond recognition and the words being manipulated on the inside to fit the the model, there's before and after pictures in it, all these things that didn't feel right for me, but I did. Right. I did it anyways because- So who was, who was the the person in your ear that was like pushing you in that direction that didn't feel right? 
Is it just the the dangling carrot out front? Like this is going to be, if you want to really blow this up, like this is it the way you do it. And my ego, like this is great. I get a book. I get to get out in the world. And also my responsibility to my franchisees to because we're a small fish in the, uh-huh. and this would get us national exposure, get people in our doors. Um, you know, I've always thought having a book is like you arrive when you have a book and I just jumped on it without really investigating, like, is this the right fit for me? Right. Is this or what right? is the book that you want? What is yeah, it that it, you actually want to say? It wasn't my book. They had it all figured yeah. out and they put my image on it basically. Uh-huh. Right. And so that's my, I take accountability for that. Not them. I mean, I could have said no, but we ended up pulling the book. Um, and not selling it and the DVDs at the time. And what we learned there is, oh yeah, if we, our definition of a core value is we are willing to take a financial hit to uphold the core value. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about driving the revenue. It's really like, we're going to, we're going to scale back because this value is so important to us. Right. And that, that over and over again, um, we've learned and I've learned personally in my own body and you know, what works for me. Everybody matters is another one of our core values, and that's how we talk about the anti-guru and being really open and democratic and collective wisdom. Listening to our clients, listening to our franchisees, our owners, all these women who have invested their life savings into this concept, really exercising that they matter. That's a practice. It's hard to do, yeah. uh, but it's something we really believe in, and we're really leaning into more and more and more. Um, and when it comes to everybody matters, the other thing I'm very self-aware of and working towards, and our whole team is investigating this, is that wellness in general is affluent white women in my industry. Yeah. And, and, and I know that's, you're sitting across from me, that's who I am, right? I'm aware of that. And that is not healthy. It It's, I'm healthy, but that weren't we're not in diversity mm-hmm. is is not healthy mm-hmm. in wellness. And so that's something we're really leaning into is how do we really uphold that value? How do you? We are asking a lot of questions. I don't have the answers, but I have radical curiosity around it. And we are asking questions amongst ourselves and, and with other people in our in our network. How do we raise diversity in leadership first in our organization? How do we represent more equally um, all throughout our organization at the executive level, all the way through our studios into our instructors. So we're showing up um, as leaders in a diverse way. Mm-hmm. So that's step number one. Mm-hmm. And um, then having these kinds of conversations, just saying it out loud and yeah. asking for help and um, knowing that it really does matter. And it's more inviting. I love classes when I walk in and it's just all, where we go, where we do really well with Everybody Matters that we've been focused on is body diversity, age diversity, economic diversity. We right. do those three things really well. Right. Um, basically, the mission is, I mean, this is from your website, body positivity and and female empowerment, redefining what it means, what fitness means, redefining fitness success. Mm-hmm. Did you... No, from the very and and the franchise model is really endemic to that, right? Like that's mm-hmm. a big part of it. Did you know from the beginning that you wanted to do this in that franchise way? Yeah, so that you could empower these other people to create businesses and empower teams and other women. Like, what was the philosophy behind that? Yeah, and we didn't franchise at Twenty Four Hour Fitness, so that was a right. new new model for us. That was owner operate. Uh-huh. Um, we had investment at Twenty Four Hour Fitness, owned everything. So we decided on franchising because, as our growth strategy because it was really interesting to us to think about having a business partner who their investment into the business, their financial investment, they were, they, they were going to actually be present in the studio. So we're owner-operated. Uh-huh. They invest and they uphold the product. And that commitment level was exciting to Chris and I that we'll have empowered business women and men um, putting their own skin in the game and blood, sweat, and tears. Right. I'm sure there were people telling you, don't do that. Like, go the private equity route. If you want to you really- You won't be able to right. control it. Yeah. You won't be able to control the product and the premium aspect of what mm-hmm. you want to create doing it that way. Right. And um, 
the control is right, but I don't want to control people anyways. Even if we owned all the studios, I don't want to control people because over and over again, I learn that when I let go of that, our product becomes better. Yes, it'll go down this, like it won't always be great and exactly what I define as awesome, but there's always something to learn from that. And when you create an organization of people that are allowed to try things and be a part of it, um, usually in my experience, it gets better, not worse. Yeah. That uh, pushes my control freak button mm, big time. We yeah. were talking about this in the kitchen. Um, there is a, you have to develop a huge capacity for letting go because your product, as you were, as you were saying, isn't a wheel of cheese or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a McDonald's hamburger. It's a, it's a service and Perfect. that service is delivered by a human being mm -hmm. and every human being is different and they're mm -hmm. going to have their own way of doing this thing that Thank you goodness. worked hard to create, Thank right? Goodness. And you have to be like, cool with that. In fact, yes. you're encouraging that. Well, with, so any creative person will tell you, you need structure to be creative. Uh -huh. We have structure. We have a very clear blueprint and knowledge base around sequencing and musicality and all the things. We do give them very, very contained guardrails yeah. around how, but within that structure, insert you. Insert your, your whole self into it authentically. Choose your words. Choose your own story and your own body way to make this class relevant for you. I think it's so kind of sad to go to a class and see an instructor robotically teaching something that they memorized mm -hmm. versus really it, it, it creates a barrier between me as a student and the teacher. They're not able to yeah. really connect and be themselves. And so while it's scary and it can turn sideways sometimes, it usually um, creates more connection and community. And most people that we've surveyed, like I think that people wouldn't necessarily say Bar 3 is the most technical of them all, but I think most people would say Bar 3 has an amazing community. Uh -huh. And that's the key thing, right? Like that's the, that's heart, of the, whole, that's the heart of the whole deal. That's the heart of the whole deal. One thing that I read that I thought was super interesting was on this subject matter of you know these varying personalities teaching this program um, is this curiosity that you had around like why are some classes more popular than others and realizing that a lot of it was rooted in voice inflection. Mm -hmm. so, so walk me through that. I think yeah. that's really interesting. We had the coolest aha, me and a team of trainers. We're always bringing in experts for the body. Uh -huh. And I had an observation going to classes that the, the tone of someone's voice and inflection created a more contained kind of exciting, exhilarating class or sort of a, a not so interesting class, but it was technically the exact same class. And what we learned, and I'm always self-conscious talking about this because I start uh -huh. to listen to my own inflections <laughs> and I just did it, that we tend to end in oh question my marks. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, women, but all we we are conditioned to end a lot of sentences in question marks. So, root your foot to the floor, mm -hmm. and then we'll go to the mat, and then da -da -da. there's this upward, and the question mark is an unconscious. Am I enough? Are you with me? Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Do you see me? Like, there's something in that. My instructors that were like, root your feet to the floor, stand tall. We're coming to the mat. You know, that sense of like, I am here, I have this voice. And there's also a vibration, a kind of a, they were using their diaphragm. So we brought in a voice coach. Let, let's look at this. And this voice coach just got in there with us talking about how voice is so much more than just speaking. It's our how we use our diaphragm. And we all realize that in fitness, we've all been taught to suck in our bellies. And so a lot of us were talking like this and we were talking in our face voices because we weren't breathing into our bellies because we were afraid of expanding our bellies. Mm. So we even changed our retail line, like to more flowy tops and inviting the belly to breathe, inviting the diaphragm, inviting voice. And that voice is another way we show up in the world. And that what a ser service, it's so beautiful. We have voice training for now, not just instructors, it's part of our instructor training now, but our, my whole team at the home office. Right. So when we stand up in front of an audience, our voice mirrors our strength and doesn't, doesn't undermine it. 
And have you been able to measure the impact of those changes on the experience yeah. of the, the person who's taking the class? Yeah, I mean, our one instructor in particular, but it was across the board, we saw so many changes. Her class is waitlisted now. Uh -huh. And she is one of my top trainers. She, and she was a musical performer and just the most incredible woman ever. It's, she had a, She got into her chest voice and her intimacy more versus performance. And it's nobody knew. It's not a thing you can really understand. I don't think any client would ever understand that connection, but... Um, yeah, it was a huge part. That voice, and then we also really looked at like all the senses, heat, sound, um, the vibe. Right. It matters. What is the experience that you want somebody taking that class that like, what, what do you, how do you want them to feel when they leave? Like, what is it that you're going for? Balanced in body, more balanced in body and empowered from within. If I was to just distill it. And that took a lot uh -huh. of time for us to really work through what that meant. Um, but that really is over and over again. When we get out to teach, that's what we're doing. Recognizing imbalances, working towards a more balanced state, not being attached, um, but more importantly, being empowered from within yeah. and feeling not depleted, but energized, rewarded, connected um, in community. The reason we love the ballet bar is it wraps around the room as a circle. And I really believe in formation matters and that our environment matters. And when we're at the ballet bar, we're facing the bar. So we're not seeing each other. We have this sense permission of solitude and connectedness inside. Yet we're shoulder to shoulder with other people in the classroom with a clear definition of that's our goal is to give you permission to be your own best teacher. Yeah. And so there's something about being being having people witness that being near you while you're doing it, that I think reinforces that feeling of uh -huh. I'm empowered in it. It's okay. Like people are seeing me and um, respecting that I'm making different choices than they are in my body. Right. I should know the answer to this, but can a dude go to the class? Is it women only? Because yeah. I just assumed it's a, like it's, to me, I, I, yeah. you know, I drive by these bar and I was like, well, that's, that's off limits for me. You know, like yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I like, as, there's this whole of, shadow of, world of, of like you would female think that. fitness that's like behind it's, a velvet rope that I'm not allowed I to know. pass. I <laughs> know, of course you would think that. Yeah. We've been thinking about, we've been talking about this. So the thing with women's empowerment, of course we're a part of that, but yeah. it is. this is not for women. We all need to be a part of this. This is human conditioning. How many guys go there? Work. A few, mm -hmm. very few. Does and, Chris go? Um, not so much because he, more, he just needs to get away from us. Okay. <laughs> He's like the only man in our office. There's uh -huh. like four men in right. our office. and um, He's got to go to like the shooting range or something, identity. balance out his testosterone. <laughs> he's, big, he's a big golfer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's a big golfer. Uh, yes, I, men for sure. And we are, that's another part of our diversity is raising more men mm -hmm. within our organization as instructors and leaders. Yeah, I would be like, like, if I had curiosity, I'd be like, I can't go in, in that lobby of that be, building. <laughs> you don't have to be flexible, coordinated. Right. It's not dance. It's not ballet uh -huh. at all. Um, we it's lunges. It's isometric work. It's um, we kind of we hold the body. We move small in certain ways. We move large. We do rhythm. It's it's basically a balance. It's a full body balance workout that combines cardio, mindfulness, and strength conditioning. Mm -hmm. In you know, a, a specific approach of teaching. Yeah. So it. it's that is not female right. oriented. That's right. Everybody I mean, it oriented. sounds good to me. Yeah. You know, there is a downbeat. We love we love music. We have a very specific tone mm -hmm. with our with the music. So there is a sense of that. But it's also you'll see people going to the four count or the two count or the single. Everybody picks. You can pick your own beat. I mean, it's right. It's yeah. So you've got one hundred and forty. 100, 140 now, open. Mm -hmm. Right. Another Six of 20. those you own and the rest of those are franchise mm -hmm. franchises. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's ridiculous growth. Was there, an, an back to this idea of inflection points, was there like an inflection point or two along the way where it, you saw like this kind of hockey stick growth or like to what do you attribute like that level of expansion? That, I mean, we, that's actually... <laughs> In our industry and how strong our product is and how liked it was, we could uh, we could be double yeah. the amount of studios. 
we made a conscious choice to slow down on growth when we could have sold. Yeah. There was there was this moment we could sell to private equity with the intent if we did that that they we would have this group of people supporting us. You could just really blow it up. And really blow it out. Yeah. And I can't imagine that moment has passed though. That's no, probably, it's still it's, it's, it's still, available to it's you. It's still a, it's still out there. I and, mean, that's got to be challenging, you know, to think like, oh my god, I could sell this thing and It's challenging when we're fatigued. Yeah. Honestly, it's challenging when we're fatigued. That's not a good reason to sell. Like, because right. all my owners are like, you know, that's I so we're really self-aware of that and we do the work. We investigate that all the time. And that when I say do the work, we an- inner work, what matters, what's mm. right. We'll be okay. We have plenty, we have enough. That's Chris and I's mantra. Plenty and enough. And then how can we magnify and optimize what we have here? Because it is so special. I mean, really, it's just special. And and is there a way now to create a growth strategy that honors what's special about it, that it is still heart-centered, yeah. that we do have people, amazing magnetic leaders running it now? And I definitely see Bar 3 outside of myself. I didn't two years ago. Yeah. It's not mine anymore. And... We are right now um, working with a wonderful executive recruiter, um, Roy Noto, um, to hire someone to come in and help us run the company. So we are finding someone else to help us who really enjoys scaling, really enjoys operating. Um, you know, all the things that Chris and I ha- really need someone else yeah. to come in and help us with. That's our, our new growth strategy. Yeah. I mean, I think an argument can be made that that, you know, to some extent, Soul Cycle lost its soul, you know, by selling it. And when you're in a position mm-hmm. where, you know, growth is basically the only important metric, and there's so much pressure on you to scale at an exponential rate that it's almost impossible to maintain the kind of core integrity that begat the thing to begin with. Yeah, it's oh gosh, when that that Soul Cycle stuff came out, I sent the founders so much love and yeah. strength and power and. They, I do, I think I have mad respect for them and I understand their choices. And, um, and, and in a way, it's a gift. And I hope they see that way too, that it's okay. Like, this is, that's, of course, like, that's how business works. Like, we've all been, that's how mm-hmm. we've all been told that's what success is. And so I don't think there's any shame in that story. And I think they're re- rebuilding and they're a beautiful yeah. organization. I mean, I, it's I, just, it's, I, I don't mean to throw shade at them at no, all. No, but it's, it is that, no, that's yeah. the story. No, I get what you yeah. mean. That, that was the headline. And I think there's always an investigation under that. Like, okay, that's the headline, but that doesn't need to be all of our story. That doesn't need to be our story. Let's change right. this. And I do believe that there are great investment companies out there that would at some, I just have to mm-hmm. believe that at some point could help. You know, right. I think angel investment is probably a really good route for us. I don't know yet, but mm-hmm. um, we really, you just have one investor, right? The the twenty four hour fitness. Yeah, guy. at the very beginning, he's been an awesome yeah. advisor and um, not an active participant in the operations of yeah. the company or leadership in the company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and a, and another big part of this whole thing is the online subscription aspect of it as yeah. well, right? Mm-hmm. That's where I'm really leaning. I'm leaning into that. Big time, I think that's so, so good. Um, and something I really want to grow into even more. We, we've that side of our business is basically drafted off the studios versus us being really um, intentional about that growth strategy, which is really different than the actual experience of being together in a studio. Uh-huh. The beautiful thing about working out at home is you have even more permission back to when I was pregnant at home to be in your body yeah. and confident. And so I really love that aspect. And we want to learn more about how we can reach people. Mm -hmm. Um, The tricky thing there is trying to hold on to that core value of community, right? Like there is such a thing as as virtual community, but it's not the same as the experience of like bonding with human beings in in, in an analog real life setting. It's not the same. I think it's how we use that device that it doesn't use us, that we use the device. Like we use our phones, yeah. we use all the, you know, whatever it is um, in a way that serves us and to be really clear on that. And that's in fact should be part of our teaching, right? Yeah. As we're teaching the class, reminding that do this so you can then shut it off and be more present as a mother, you know, win the race that you're training for, whatever it is. Yeah. 
Well, as this uh, CEO and founder who you know gets a lot of press and makes all these fancy lists of you know the top this and that, do you think about um, you know how you model yourself to the next generation of female entrepreneurs, like in a mentorship context? Like, how do you think about that? Well, when all this stuff was going down about me as a you know, that, that anonymous survey and <clears throat> remarks about who I was as a leader. I was like, I had a lot of imposter syndrome <laughs> uh-huh. about being the CEO. And I, and my brother actually said to me, because I said, you know, I don't, I want to just step back. I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't me. I'm not good at this. And he said, you keep that title. Yes, you are. I mean, we right. grew up Miguel, with women. Miguel yeah. said this, yeah. Keep that title. Do not let go of that title. You're redesigning it. You're redesigning what it is to be a CEO. Maybe, you know, and so in my mind, I've changed it to chief energy officer Mm -hmm. and that I'm tapping into that and um, my feminine side and being okay. The reason, there's a reason why there aren't very many women CEOs. It's because that construct doesn't work for a lot of women. And the ones, some women it does because they're able to, they, it just is a natural alignment for them. But most women, obviously it isn't, or we wouldn't, there would be more of us as CEOs. So maybe we need to redefine what that means. And so I, that's the one kind of feminist like side of me that's like, yeah, I'm going to keep that title. Yeah. Even though I'm really looking at peeling back even more in terms of executive leadership. So uh, yeah. And, and I think more so than being a leader, I think of future generations that collectively, not just Bar 3, but all of us that are doing this kind of work about letting go of external forces and the measures that are attached to those Uh as defining our success, and that that's a practice, to let go of that external force and instead look inside what really matters to me. Let me practice that. Let me show up that way. Whatever we practice, we become. And that if all of us do that more, 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 then those forces will change. That the conditioning for our daughters and their daughters and their daughters and sons mm-hmm. or however they identify will be more in alignment with people being empowered. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's more important to me. There's a tired trope around the female CEO, which is that you you have to literally be superhuman and be this you know incredible mom and partner and executive, and you have to excel in all of those areas, mm-hmm. and then you have to field you know a bunch of questions about how you balance being a mom with running a company, which. You know, a male CEO never gets. Nobody's asking the male CEOs like how they how they balance being an amazing dad with <laughs> running a yeah. company. You know, there's an mm-hmm. imbalance mm-hmm. in how we you know and how we treat and think about women entrepreneurs. Yeah, and each of us as women, um, whoever's listening to this, we have the worst part about that is our own inner critic. We have that voice inside met, of our heads. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're trying to measure yourself against yeah. that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm not enough. I'm not enough a mom. I'm not enough a wife. I'm not enough a CEO. I'm not enough. That is that voice. That's the only thing we can truly control. We mm. can't control all the external forces out there. That's yeah. what I mean, that conditioned world. But I think when you you did a bunch of interviews after you had that kind of epiphany and you know talked about the anonymous survey and how this kind of brought you to your knees and you had to rethink everything. And I think that was a beautiful like offering to give the other, you know, sort of female executives out there permission to like take a breath, you know, yeah. and realize that they're not alone in this. We're not alone. Yeah. That is the best message over and over again. My mom said to me, it struck me like a lightning bolt when I was talking to her on the phone, Sadie, you are always going to suffer. You are always going to suffer. And for some reason, that sounds so sad, right? But for <laughs> some reason, it gave me so much freedom. Uh-huh. As It's okay to suffer. And in fact, it's human. Every single one of us suffer. Every single one of us has an inner critic. I don't know why that was very freeing for me. Mm. That in combination with, and I can change that inner critic to inner warrior. I have the power to change that conversation in my yeah. own mind, in my own self, and then talk about it so other women have permission to, and men have permission to do yeah. the same thing. When you look at at your success, like what do you think is has been your greatest strength? Like what has contributed to this? You know, incredibly successful organization. 
Uh, I would say I don't even consider it a strength. It's just truly who I am is being open and vulnerable. And thank you, Brene Brown, for put, bringing right. words around that because I before I read her books and saw her, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, and that she just put such framing, she framed it for so many of us. And that is true. I mean, that is, I lead with a courageous, vulnerable heart. And uh-huh. um, that's how I, because I was trained in that from a very young age. Yeah. And inviting that into other people's lives to do the same thing is what I, I genuinely enjoy doing. So I, I think that's what's attracted people to the organization. It's mm-hmm. why people stay. It's also why some people leave. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> well, these things have to find their own level. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when you look back, mm-hmm. you know, other than the things we've already talked about, like what are the some of the lessons or mistakes that you made that have been instructive and in how you kind of lead more mindfully now? I really had an ego in the beginning. And even in my language, I'd say I how I wanted to do it was, and I wonder if I've been doing that in this interview. I've been really thinking about that. I did start bar three, but now it's we. I mean, 100,000%. And that's what, I mean, I told, told you about instructor circle and yeah. you all matter. But I don't think I was always showing up that way. I would dominate conversations and meetings, uh, interrupt, um, or try to... I was being fed this message out in the world that you're the face of this company. And so I think that that got to me. Mm. And and that's been a good reconciliation reconciliation for me. Um, that that didn't serve me at all. It made me feel awful. And um, just to remember that that's a false sense of power. That's not real. And um, that's been a really powerful journey. Yeah. And I really do think being a business owner is a, a the most amazing way to develop as a person if you lean into it and you're okay sharing and growing that way. Um, and now, of course, learning active listening skills and just making fun of myself <laughs> yeah. and all the things, um, it's so much more fun, uh-huh. you know, and things are happening and it's freedom and... Um, and I'm letting go, being an aging woman in the world, you know, I'm told every day not to age, don't age, don't age, don't age. And I think that I was trying to overcompensate, mm. you know, for that. And um, that's been a whole new thing. It was just being okay aging and um, really. Yeah, you wrote a piece about that. Mm-hmm. I talk about, I love talking about age. Yeah. I just was with my godmother, who is the oldest of my mom's friends, um, who is truly my spiritual mother. Um, I was in bed with her when she passed away. There was 12 of us around the bed. And I was in with her and with my hand on her heart. And it was the greatest privilege and gift. And um, what I learned in my body in that moment viscerally is life is finite. Energy is finite. And that what an honor to age. What an honor. Mm. And to be present and remember that... um, is so grounding and and so I'm fascinated with aging and death and everything right now. Like I cannot stop thinking about death. I, I, being a part of that experience was, um, I don't know, it was forever life changing. Yeah. You sound exactly like Julie. <laughs> you guys <laughs> I know, I have a get feeling. in a room and we need to come out four days. We need later. to eat some cheese yeah, together. I think so um, she loves talking <laughs> about death. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I think it's unique to be in the kind of health and wellness space and also have a healthy perspective on the finality of this experience and mm-hmm. an appreciation for its temporality and and to just kind of fall in love with, you know, this journey of getting older. Mm-hmm. You know, as opposed to combating it and fighting it and it's it's I think it's a you know, it's part of this more macro conversation that we're having about um holding things loosely, right? As mm-hmm. opposed to like the fitness, hold it tight and push it hard and, you know, fight and, you know, claw your way mm-hmm. at every step rather than being more in the allowing, you mm-hmm. know, and the empowering. Yeah. Well, the other thing I want to 
talk about just sitting across the table from someone that I admire so much who is the most incredible athlete. You know, your story is so, so, so amazing. Is that I think I'm interpreted often as, oh, that's soft and sweet. And my, and it doesn't mean that it's not hard work. Yeah. Like all of what I'm talking about, I think has a lot to do with being an endurance athlete, for example. There's nothing wrong with wanting to win. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the results and the pain and like the the resilience and the grit and the pushing through and the healing, the heart, the, that hard work, right? Um, and like, I just think that every one of us can practice that in a different way. And that there's just, there's not one way to do that, but it's always brave space that when I was talking about brave space, uh-huh. I, my favorite quote is it's the sand and the oyster that makes the pearl, the rub. And so like with bar three, it is challenging. You do go to fatigue. It does, it is a struggle. And then it's learning to breathe through that struggle and, uh-huh. and look at it without judgment or shame and then work all the way through it. I, that's one thing that happens in like, like my friend, Anne says, I'm, you're, she's my, I'm her woo-woo friend. She's like, you always bring the woo. Thanks uh-huh. for bringing the woo-woo. And we were talking about how woo-woo can sound so soft and easy. Um, and I get what she means by woo-woo. And I always say, I'm woo. I'm not woo-woo. Uh-huh. I'm like half woo. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and I'm I half. mean, woo-woo gets, we need a new word. You know yeah, what I mean? Because I there's, a, there's a different way to frame it, which is to be a Jedi warrior. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like you have yes, to, I like you have that. to be, you have to be like <laughs> rooted in in some of these kind of age old tenets that have to do with surrender and allowing, but are actually and vulnerability, mm-hmm. and and when to lean into them and when to be in action. And it's that mm-hmm. interplay, that balance, that ballet between the two, that yeah. that you know creates the person that can um, not just manifest the big vision in the three-dimensional world as you've done, but do it with grace and humility, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so and you have to have- And resilience and grit and- All of those things, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and when you're, when you're saying, when you're, when you're describing me like, oh, this, this athlete and all this sort of thing, like I'm just sitting here thinking about my version of your story, which is, mm-hmm. yeah, you can find pictures of me on the internet where I'm completely shredded, mm-hmm. you know, and I look ridiculously fit in a way that's inaccessible for people, but that's not how I look right now. You know, yeah. like I look like that for five minutes when yeah. I was training two years straight for a crazy race mm-hmm. and then that was over with. Um, Do you ever look at that and, and kind of want to like go back to that? Yes and no. I mean, that's part of, you know, on the subject of aging, mm-hmm. you know, it's part of part of this for me is is embracing where I'm at right now and being okay with that. Like, yeah. if I'm constantly measuring myself, you know, by a yardstick of what I look like ten years ago, right before a race that I put everything into, then I'm going to suffer more than I need That's to, right. you know. And and Julie's always saying like, you just you have to do like you have to go out and trail run and do these things that you enjoy doing for the love of it not for a performance goal right. or because you have an agenda but because it's who you are yes and it doesn't have to be about a metric who you are right now yeah and yeah and and you know so for me it's like oh people you know i bump into them and they say, oh, did you run 50 miles today? Or how, you know, like, mm-hmm. like no, that's not how, you know, I'm right. podcasting and like, <laughs> I haven't taken a break in seven years and mm-hmm. I'm like grinding like crazy working seven days a week. And now mm-hmm. I'm doubling down on that because I'm gonna take my first like real sabbatical in December for the first time Amazing. in many years. But mm-hmm. that means that my workload now is double or triple what it normally is. Right. So my self-care regimen is like out the window right, right now trying to get all of this done. And it goes back to that thing of like, all this wellness is making me unwell or the fitness <laughs> yeah. is making me unfit. This industry right. that we're in or this business or this projected image of who you are, who yeah. you're supposed to be, isn't matching your your reality in the moment. Yeah. And and how do you how do you like not shame yourself over that and just be okay with it and be right. like, this is for now because right. I'm doing this thing. Yes. And this will balance out. In this moment. Yeah. In this moment. Right. In this moment. I know the 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 backstory, like looking the back to the before and after picture, so many of our after pictures are in the past. Yeah. And the one that kills me and just is so ridiculous is m- new moms. When you have a baby, what does the fitness industry tell you to do? Mm. Bounce back. Mm-hmm. That's like the predominant message. Bounce back with this class. So you're supposed to go backwards and not be a, like really the message is don't be a mother. 
Like once you have a child, you are a mother. Uh-huh. There is an external measure. It's called a baby. And your, <laughs> your, your body yeah, yeah. is forever changed. Uh-huh. But then we go to classes to bounce back. There's so much shame in that. And it's absolutely impossible. There's no right. way we'll ever go back. And so... Again, language, conditioning, and rem- and just all of us, I think, just remembering how ridiculous that story is. Uh-huh. We all know it's ridiculous. And then practicing, remembering, oh, that doesn't matter. Right now matters. This moment. Right. This moment. Yeah. Um, Move forward gracefully isn't as catchy. No. Well, how about just be alive in your body right now? What do you need? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I need to get away from my baby for 40 minutes, uh-huh. 10 minutes and move and and be alive in my body without my baby. Like that's what I need. You know, I don't need to like reshape my body right, right. this moment. Right. That's not really what you need as a new yeah. mom, right? So there's it's just it's that constant remembering what we kind of already know inside. So what is the the state of the fitness industry now from your estimation? Like are we are we doing a better job? Are we moving in the right direction? Yes. I do think we are moving in a really good direction. I the whole idea of empowerment is almost it's big right now. It's trending. And the which I like. So I think language is really important. Language shifts, thoughts become things. And so there's a lot of message about body positivity. Um, even in imagery, there's there's all shapes and sizes when I'm specifically talking about women. That's really, really positive and making a shift. And it's more confusing than ever because when you look at Instagram, which my, I have a 15-year-old daughter mm-hmm. and and my son too, and just sh- like, and for myself, like going through, we're seeing thousands and thousands of images 24 seven now. It's not that like it used to be where I'd open the Victoria's Secret catalog when I was in high school and pour over those women's bodies. And that's what sexy is. That's what worthy is. I remember just like thinking I, my body needs to be like that. Now it's on your phone and it's the girl next door, the guy next door with filters and um, just slight adjustments and still objectifying the body, but with positivity in the language. Right. So there'll be like a picture of someone with like 70,000 likes or whatever, and she's showing a ripped, beautiful body. And then in it say, don't compare about, yourself yeah, to anybody. Yeah, it's all about self-acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, Whoa, it's confusing. I love, those are my favorite because it's so oh, preposterous. It's so confusing. And so transparently wrong, you know, but... Effective, obviously, so it many works. people. Yeah, that's what like, sells. She has way more. I mean, these right. people have way more attention out there in the world. I don't know if it, it's helping, um, and I think they're within good intentions because they're doing legacy based stuff and they're building their own business. And I get that. And I think there just needs to be a general awareness about it mm-hmm. um, that this social the the proliferation of imagery is is worse than it used to be. That the, the yeah. forces in the world are more than they used to be. Yeah, and I, I don't think that we really understand the implications of this yet. Mm-mm. So how does all of that affect how you parent? Oh my gosh, I feel like I'm a brand new parent right now. I feel like I have a baby in the car seat coming home from the hospital, like give me a manual, I don't know what I'm doing. Because a teenage daughter, <laughs> yes. this is the joke that I have all the time with Julie. I'm like, because we, we raised together two boys, my stepsons, um, who are now grown and out of the house. and you know, it had its challenges, but overall it was like fine. And I thought that I kind of had parenting figured out Mm -hmm. and and having a teenage daughter, that's just all out the window. Like I have, Mm -hmm. I am completely ill-equipped to manage (laughs) this situation. (laughs) Okay, so you're no help. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm asking you. I was hoping to get We could just commiserate over our ineffectiveness. I love it though, I love this stage. I well, first of all, I don't feel like it was that long ago. I was fifteen. I identify with her more. I get her, uh-huh. um, which is kind of alarming, right? I some of the things I think about myself at her age and what I did and how I behaved, and um, I just think over and over again what my mom always tells me is just see her, just keep seeing her, it, it, and you know, I'll, she would sh- she'll share something with me. And I'll really think about a good response. And like just recently she shared something pretty important and I responded back and she's just, and I thought I did such a good job. She's like, mom, you sound like an Instagram ad. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. Well, you're just in the phase where you you really, you can't, there's nothing you could say that's going to be right. And I think for me, it's just how can I make sure that the communication is always open and doesn't shut down? It's there. If if she's, both my kids know, if they need to come to talk to me, I'm going to listen. Yeah. And um, without shame and judgment. And I think that's harder for them because I am seen in the public eye so much. And that's really been confusing. I didn't have that. I don't, yeah. nobody's equipped me to be a parent. I'm as a public figure yeah. for them to see like their, maybe their friend's moms know who I am or people in restaurants come up to me mm. or that whole thing. Um, and then to be in fitness and that side of it and to be so successful and to talk about all this intimate stuff. I think that's intimidating for kids. Yeah. Um, do, well, who am I in this? Like, what is my success story? Do I need to live up to that? Right. Uh, so that's, you know, we all did core values. I do this really fun core values exercise, really profound core values exercise at our retreats. And I did it with the family and we all have our core values up on the fridge. And one of Audrey's is freedom. I think a lot of teenagers probably share that. Yeah. But I really think that is her, that's going to stick with her forever. And I always have to remember that, that her core value is freedom, freedom in defining who she is, freedom in rules, freedom in general, and honoring that. Yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. I might try that. It, if it's I ask really my neat. daughter to write down her core values, she might just pivot and walk away from me. <laughs> yeah, you got maybe third yeah. party it. How do you deliver that message? Third party. No, um, I think that's great. Mm-hmm. I, I think, um, what was I going to say? I, you know, I, I think that uh, it's really hard to be a teenager right now. You know, it's a very confusing time. Mm -hmm. And the more compassionate I can be about that and just be a good listener, Mm -hmm. the better off I am going to be. Yeah. And it's cliche. And I know it's true. How we show up is how they learn. Yeah. In the in-between moments, not Mm -hmm. in the talk, like the big talks or the, you know, the Instagram moment when she said, you sound like an Instagram. That's not really when she's going to learn anyways. It's my behaviors and how I'm, yeah. Yeah. Does your daughter come to bar classes? It now that her friends think it's cool. Uh, you know, I think that that that's cool that she gets to go with her friends. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's an incredible athlete. She's um, s- soccer player. Just, oh, cool. Yeah, cool. she's she's a fun athlete to watch. All right, well let's uh, let's land this plane. Um, maybe we can close it out with just a few thoughts for the budding uh, women entrepreneurs out there or any mm-hmm. entrepreneur for for that matter, I suppose, um, people who are looking to create something, like mm-hmm. what are some words of wisdom that you can mm-hmm. close this down with? Uh, you already are creating in this moment and that just the idea or the thought is a creation, right? And um, so that's one, you're already creating, you're already there, you're already doing it. It's a practice. It'll always be like that. And trusting that and honoring that versus I'm not good enough. I'm not there yet. I haven't done it yet. Mm. I don't know how to do it. I can't do that. How? Why would I? Who am I to start my own fitness concept, right? It's, well, if you're thinking about it, you're already creating. Second is tre- um, you already know the answers. Uh, over and over again, in my experience, when I scratch my own itch, there's other people like me that have that same itch. And to, to know that a data point of one is also really important than a statistical survey yeah. over across millions. Yeah. Uh, specifically, if you're creating something out of a problem that is personal for you, which I think a lot of people in fitness, that's how it happens. Um, and then uh, I would say the third is to be open to learning and just surrounding yourself with people who you can learn from and um, grow with and who make you uncomfortable just enough where you're you're failing and falling forward and mm-hmm. and getting back up again and getting mm-hmm. back up again and getting back up in, in, a, in a safe space community is key yeah I like that idea of the end of one like like trusting like if you are sort of integrated enough where you can trust that intuitive voice um, to understand that just because you might be the only one who's feeling that, that that's still valid. Like that's what Hollywood is built on. Somebody has an idea for a movie because mm-hmm. it's the movie they want to see and they yeah. make it into the world. You know, they, like that's how everything begins. Great products, right? great products and businesses start 
if people tell you, if you share your idea and people say, oh, that would never work. Great. That means it's probably awesome. Right. Because maybe they don't, not always, but, <laughs> but you know, you gotta be, I would be careful with that. Well, but then who cares? Try it. Right. Like I, I, there's a sense of like, just go. If you really think, and you know, why not? Like give it a go. I, I just saw Sarah Blakely speak who uh-huh. um, did Spanx. Yeah. Yeah. Her husband's a good friend of mine. Oh he was just here gosh. a couple of days ago. I, yeah. She's awesome. And nobody thought her idea was great. They're yeah. like, you're going to cut off pantyhose? Like, right. that's, she's like, no, I, perfect. It's nobody gets it yet. Right. And I think there is something to that. Same with me. I'm like, yeah, I want to do a fitness. I don't even want to call it fitness. And I want it to be about relationships and community and fighting lonely. And I don't want it to be attached to a heritage. Uh-huh. And um, I want everybody to do their own thing in a group environment. Like, all these things that people are like, that's, doesn't work. That's right. not group exercise. Yeah. That's not fitness. I'm not going to have a sales team. I'm not going to, you know, advertise. Uh-huh. Well, you're not going to get off the ground. It's not going to work. And, but we just shut out all the business books, all the noise, everything we learned at 24 Hour Fitness, honestly, we shut out. And that's how it's Bar 3 was, came into the world. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. Um, Sarah's hilarious. Oh my gosh. Do you follow her on Instagram? Now I do. Oh, it's the best. She's so authentic. (laughs) I know. Did you see the video that she put up where she's in some boardroom uh, and there's like oil paintings of all these stuffy men that had like were barons of the underwear industry going back, you know, like a hundred years or something like that. And Mm -hmm. she's like, you're telling me this guy is going to tell me what kind of underwear I should be wearing? It was the it's the funniest thing. Like, she's and hilarious. so true. I know. And so true. Anyway. Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, all right. Well, this was lovely. Thank you. So so fun. Yeah, I appreciate it. I want to go to a class now. Yes, I'll be the I only. I'll be the only guy. I mean, there might be one or two others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to find. You'll out. start I'm a sure new there's wave. One right around here somewhere. I'll tell you honestly, the men who come are athletes. Yeah. I'm they, not surprised. It's it's a really good, most of them are rock climbers and cyclists and uh-huh. basketball players. We have NBA basketball players doing bar three. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's usually the athletic bunch that, that can work through the the anxiety of, oh gosh, they're going to be all women, which is always, you know, right. it's universally women feel the same way. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the only one that looks like this. I'm not going to be coordinated right. enough, flexible enough. That's Every single, I've never met someone that didn't feel that way walking into the studio. Yeah. All right. Well, I will go and I will report back. Okay. <laughs> um, awesome. So if you're uh, digging on Sadie, you can find a class near you at bar3.com. Is it, That's the mm-hmm. website, right? B-A-R-R-E-3. And uh, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way? Instagram, Sadie Lincoln. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Yep. Good. That's it. All right. We'll yeah, come back and talk to me you. again. All Love right, cool. to you. Thank you. Bye. Peace and plants.